I'm Jay Miller, and on today's episode of George Fox Talks, I'm joined by John Kirshner, and we'll be discussing the great Quaker John Woolman, how we understand him differently today, and why he's still relevant. I'm Jay Miller, and on today's episode of George Fox Talks, I'm joined by John Kirshner, and we're going to be talking about the great 18th century Quaker John Woolman. John is a graduate of George Fox University. He's also a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary, and he has his PhD from the University of Birmingham. He's currently an adjunct professor of religion at Pacific Lutheran University, a PhD supervisor at the University of Birmingham, and works in instructional design at the University of Washington. John recently edited a special issue of the journal Quaker Studies on John Woolman um, around the time of the 250th anniversary of his death. And we'll be talking about that special issue a little later on. But um, I want to start off with a question, John, for listeners who may not be that familiar. Who was John Woolman? John Woolman was, um, I mean, he's, he's most famous as an early anti-slavery advocate. Um, but he grew up in, in Mount Holly, New Jersey. He was born in 1720. His, his grandfather um, emigrated from England to the American colonies um, at that time. Uh, and he, uh, John Woolman, um, grew up on a family farm, and he, he left us a, a journal that is kind of a spiritual autobiography where he is laying out not everything that happened in his life on a day-to-day basis, but the spiritual kind of breakthroughs that he experienced and his, his, his own developing spiritual sensitivity. Um, as an adult, he, he, he worked within his Quaker community um, and, and volunteered in his, at his, in his meeting or his church um, and, um, uh, and wrote many essays. Uh, and um, besides um, protesting anti-slavery um, in, in some really interesting ways, he, he also um, held convictions against um, against excessive wealth and especially uh, especially those um, aspects of, of 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 wealth like status seeking and um, the accumulation of luxury goods um, and then he he died in England in 1772. I wonder you know sometimes in we'll talk a little bit more about um, how woman's been received and studied. But oftentimes, I think it's fair to say at the beginning, oftentimes woman's viewed as like a heroic, saintly, unique individual. And in some ways that's all true. But I think a big emphasis of the study of John Woolman in recent years has been like the community he was a part of. Mm -hmm. So could you say a little bit more, John, about like the what Quakerism, what are the most important things to know about Quakerism in the 18th century that shaped John Woolman in his life? Yeah, so in the in the 18th century, so Quakers Quakers um, began in England in the really you could say they began in the 1650s, um, and they grew rapidly um, as a movement. They went from a very small handful of people in the 1650s to somewhere by this by the 1660s, somewhere around 50,000 or so. And they had, you know, within them this sense that they were going to, um, to spread their message. And so there was a very a strong missionizing um, aspect to the Quaker movement. Um, and so Quakerism spread to other places. And, and um, when they were persecuted in England, then, then um, you know, William Penn famously provided a place in, in the American colonies where Quakers could come and, and um, practice their faith without the, that persecution. So the Quakers who who Woolman grew up with and around um, kind of shared this this what's called a, a monotheological culture, um, mm. or at least that's how it's been described. Yeah, where um, generally they they shared similar convictions um, and um, they they viewed themselves in many ways as being you know a, a chosen set apart people, and they um, they had. They, they looked different. They dressed in a similar ways. And so they had the big hats and the same colored clothes. And, and so they, they stood out um, mm-hmm. when they were walking down the street. Uh, and in, especially in the middle Atlantic colonies, um, there were a lot of Quakers. They were perhaps um, by 1750, perhaps the third largest um, religious group in the American colonies. Mm. Um, and so they, 
you know, they were, there were a lot of them and they were everywhere and they stood out. So they were, they were noticeable and um, being, being forerunners um, in the colony of Pennsylvania and in um, what became New Jersey, they also um, had economic advantages of being, you know, early settlers um, to this area. Um, and so developing um, businesses and trade networks, um, commerce, um, there was an economic advantage also to being um, to being Quaker, uh, and so so Quakers when they when they came to the colonies with this sense of this this conviction that God could speak to them directly, um, as as George Fox said, there is one even Christ Jesus that can speak to um, your condition. Um, that Quakers um, shared this, and they pra- they worshipped in silence together, um, but but in their in the in the worldly domain, they were also you know, very successful in commerce um, and, and becoming very prosperous. So Woolman and um, his uh, a cadre of reformers that he was a part of uh, questioned the impact of this, of this economic mm-hmm. success mm-hmm. And, and started to um, assert a, a new vision of Quakerism that was kind of what he would say is perhaps less entangled mm-hmm. with worldly affairs, more focused on following the direct leadings of Christ mm-hmm. in the day-to-day um, and, and renouncing those outward, um, outward kind of show, that outward show of wealth and luxury. And so that the, the community that Woolman was a part of um, has been called the, the, the Reformation of American Quakerism. It was a, a group of people about about Woolman's age um, that that came into leadership that started increasing um, increasing the the discipline mm-hmm. within the, the yearly meeting so that um, so that some pra- practices like you know I'm I'm dressed in Quaker garb but it's but I have these little ornate you know pieces to to my garb that are standing out so that that those were more likely to. To, be, to receive discipline and especially marrying outside of meeting. Mm-hmm. That marrying outside of meeting was, um, some Quakers thought was diluting the, mm-hmm. Quaker, the Quaker testimony. Um, and for, for Woolman um, and, and several others, um, s- slaveholding was a, a key element of this. Um, it was, you know, it was oppressive. It was, um, you know, sacrificing the life of some for the, the financial benefit of others. Um, and uh, he, uh, so he and several others became, would travel around from meeting to meeting up and down the colonies mm. and, and um, go to yearly meetings, go to these large gatherings of Quakers and, and preach their message and encourage people to reform their practices. Um, and then eventually he was one of a group of Quakers who would go house to house mm-hmm. and would would labor, as they called it, or would try to convince um, Quaker slaveholders to release um, and free their their um, the people who were in bondage under them, uh, and and so so he was he was key in developing that um, within this this culture of reform, and I, I think he he also was was part of, and I'm I'm interested also in what you have to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. He he also was was growing up in this in this period of time that was um, became um, known as the Quietist era, um, which the Quietist spirituality focused on um, at least a, a caricature of Quietism focuses on you know inward withdrawal from the world um, and um, kind of denying oneself and even even like the mortification of oneself. Um, so that the the individual ceases to be an entity um, in in complete subjection to God, mm-hmm. and I have some quibbles with that definition, mm-hmm. um, but but that's that's the view of Quakerism by the late 18th century that that becomes dominant, um, and I think Woolman, in some interesting ways, kind of challenges that narrative and um, and promotes a more a, a still very much a practice of being um, subjected to God's will as a means for for acting faithfully and for embodying in in, in very powerful ways um, what it means to be a Quaker or an, and a Christian um, in a really 
in a time period where there's lots of change. There's the French and Indian War. There's um, you know, the colonialism is continuing to expand. Just lots of change happening. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really dynamic time, and it's a really fascinating period of Quaker history that I think is paradoxical and that we wrestle to grapple with because we do tend to see it, I think, through the kind of leading lights of the 18th century, like a John Woolman or an Anthony Benezet. People, you know, in some ways, broadly, the story that we think about for Quakerism in the 18th century is an anti-slavery story. Mm -hmm. And I, I, what I appreciate about what you said is, I, and I think is important to highlight for listeners, is that we think today, when we think of Quakers, we oftentimes associate them with anti-slavery and abolition um, in a kind of absolute kind of way. Um, but the 18th century and woman really shows that this like opposition to slavery wasn't a part of the early phase of Quakers. Quakers are slave owners in the Caribbean, especially, but also kind of on mainland North America. And that anti-slavery and abolition are these very gradualist processes. In fact, woman dies in 1772. And it's not until later in the 1770s that Quakers are taking their strongest stances against slaveholding being wrong and saying, if you're a slaveholder, you can't be a Quaker. We'll sort of disown you for these reasons. Um, so it's important because it recognizes the like the debate and how long it took Quakers to develop like this anti-slavery abolition line. Um, I think it's also is it a great description you gave of reform and quietism. I think maybe it, it might help listeners just to think of like Quakerism was getting kind of the approach was that reformers wanted Quakerism to be more pure. Um, and as a result of that, Quakerism gets smaller. You know, they, they essentially are able kind of to eliminate or reduce nominal Quakerism. They kind of say, like, you can't just be kind of like a nominal Quaker. You really have to, like, commit um, or we're going to disown you. Um, so it's quite an intense religious culture that can be a little hard for us in the 21st century to wrap our minds around both what would that be like to have such a total what what monotheological mm -hmm. monotheological kind of culture um and also to have one that you know probably would you know makes exclusion a much stronger part of its practice than you know even what we would think of as like exclusive churches today would yeah and i mean so to, and just a you know little fact about like what that meant. So if somebody was, you know, written out of meeting, as it were, as the, the term was, um, you know, they then the 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 Quaker community would would literally publish a statement in like the newspaper. This person is no longer a part of our com uh, of our of our group because of that. What like wanting for the, to maintain that purity. Mm -hmm. So like just to make it public that mm -hmm. this person can no longer be said to represent what it means to be a Quaker. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, they could still attend meeting. Right. But they could not give financially to the meeting. Mm. <laughs> Which is, yeah, you like know, we don't, don't want your money. Yeah, we thing. don't want your money. Yeah. yeah. And you also can't attend business meeting where decisions yeah, right, are made. Right. Decisions Which are sometimes made. I joke that maybe that's more of a blessing than a curse. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you, right. you can attend meeting for worship, but you can't come to business <laughs> meeting. Um to kind of get for, okay, that's a wonderful setup for thinking about who John Woolman was and the culture he came from, which I just, you know, I think, you know, it was intense, you yeah. know, is what kind of readers can kind of take away. And we have these, you know, kind of working to like eliminate slavery is obviously like a very intense sort of thing. To get to our discussion of like how we think about John Woolman today and the special issue you edited, could we talk really briefly about, so Woolman dies in 1772. Mm -hmm. What are the different ways from 1772 until now that John Woolman has been thought of? Yeah. So um, after, you know, soon after, within a year after, after Woolman died, um, his, some of his writings were or his journal was published, and you know, journals at this time were, were published posthumously, and so. Mm -hmm. um, but the committees that were in charge of of publishing his works, you know, they began like kind of editing his his journal, and and kind of crafting the image that that they wanted to be received. So Woolman, in his manuscripts of his journal, records I think like seven visions or dreams, and you know, most of those were edited out because that was like. That was, you know, this 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 spiritual vision of woman that that they did not want to be representative of Quakers Quakerism as a whole, 
and not what they wanted people to get from Woolman's life. So right from the very beginning, we have you know an image of Woolman. Um, his his anti-slavery statements were taken out by British Quakers. Mm. His visions were taken out. So we get this this. Um, you know, within a few years, this vision of Woolman as someone who was very self-effacing, and 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 emphasis and wanting to live um, in simplicity, and so this kind of self-effacing, you know, simple Woolman picture becomes becomes um, you know dominant. Then, in the early nineteenth century, um, when when the abolitionist movement starts picking up more broadly in American culture, um, then Woolman's anti-slavery writings um, become, you know, more popular, become, um, I remember there's a, there's a, a, an anecdote, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, of John Greenleaf Whittier, a famous um, a Quaker poet and, and writer, um, you know, telling William Lloyd Garrison that you know, along the lines of he's going to give him this great gift mm. um, for it to help his cause, and it's the Journal of John Woolman. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Woolman becomes this this you know this ally after his death within within the the transatlantic anti slavery movement. And so what's interesting in the article in the issue that on Quakers in Quaker studies that kind of commemorates um, Woolman's two hundred fiftieth two uh, hundred fiftieth year of Woolman's death is how um, you know Jeffrey Plank brings up this really amazing um, account of of a group of of Quakers who published Woolman's anti slavery essay but removed the anti slavery bits and so mm. what's you know what was left was. What they said was a more kind of universal, um, universally applicable um, statement of spirit of woman's spirituality. And again, it's you know it's a lot about renouncing and um, renouncing the the ways of the world and and looking to God. And um, but in woman's anti slavery essay, of which I was a part, all of that spirituality was to support the anti slavery. And so, as as Plank says, when when the committee republished the anti-slavery essay without the anti-slavery, mm-hmm. they tore the heart out of his essay. Mm-hmm. You know, but his readers felt when they when they looked at his writings, they said, "Okay, we're going to pull out this piece because this be this piece we feel speaks to him." Um, and readers of Woolman have been doing that um, ever ever since. Uh, you know, really, ever since he he died, um, taking his mm. his writings and kind of refashioning it to meet whatever meet the the, the cause or the the issue um, of the day, which um, is really is really fascinating. Um, I I I I think this is true that John Woolman's journal is the the longest published piece of writing in North American history, aside from the Bible. Being in continuous publication since 1774. Interesting. So, so that's um, you know I think that's that's a testimony to how his his journal has continued to have meaning um, for for different groups of people in very different times um, you know over time. So and I th- and he was you know, the Fabian Society, a, a socialist group, you know, republished his his um, a plea for the poor, mm-hmm. um, and uh, other groups have have used his his writings to support their causes because you know they find in in his his unique kind of marriage of both an you know an inward spiritual sensitivity along with this this outward embodiment of it, then then there's. There's a lot of material there that people have found resonance with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, through the 19th century, yeah, there's both. I think there are kind of two halves to woman that people can pick up on that should really be integrated, and sometimes they mm-hmm. are, but sometimes they're separated. That there's this kind of the the social conscientiousness that we see with slavery, but also he's very concerned about labor. Mm-hmm. He develops concerns about Native American peoples um, in colonial America. Um, and there's also the kind of more woman as spiritual, you know, mm. deeply Christocentric, self-denying, um, you know, beautiful writing about the kind of the spiritual life. Um, and you can either kind of lean toward one half of those or the other, or you can kind of try to integrate them. To kind of jump to the 20th century a little bit, my sense is that kind of in the 1960s, um, 
Woolman sort of is picked up again, you know, in relationship to civil rights questions, you know, his Mm -hmm. ideas about race and equality are resonant at this time. Um, This is around the time, I think it's in the 70s that we kind of get our first really good critical edition of John Mm -hmm. Woolman's journal um, that I think kind of rides on this kind of energy of him speaking to our time. Mm -hmm. And that's a big moment for the study of Woolman and the reception. But he still continues, I think, to be through much of the century kind of a Quaker saint. Um, Another kind of uh, essay in the edition that you edited or the journal that you edited is on the reception of Woolman for two major Quakers in the 20th century, Douglas Steer and Elton Trueblood, who are both very engaged with him, um, but in a relatively uh, simple way of saying he's a great example of what Quakerism should be. and not a very textured one that gets into his context or some of the nuances of his thought. Do you think that's a fair summary? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think that's a fair summary. Um, And so Elton Trueblood, you know, by by the mid 20th century, Quakers are, were largely, you know, in, it was no longer a monotheological culture. There's, you know, now there's kind of theological diversity Mm -hmm. and Douglas Steer and Elton Trueblood kind of representing, you know, two different large buckets of, um, of, of, the Quaker tradition. Um, yeah. And both of them, you know, finding something in him. And again, like you said, it was, you know, kind of a, a somewhat simplistic and kind of a utilitized version of, of Woolman. Again, um, I, th- I think the, there's a quote from, from, I think it's Elton Trueblood that, you know, he concludes about Woolman that you know, the life of Woolman shows that there is nothing better than in this world than a really good person. And it's like, we can say that, yes, that's true. Um, but also I think there's so much more. Um, it's a little banal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. So um, I think, you know, I think there's so much more. And, and um, so there's a, you know, after, after that, you know, kind of mid 20th century approach to Woolman, then, um, you know, I, I think this is with the, 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 as scholarship and, and scholars are becoming more aware of Quaker studies as a field, as, as a rigorous field of study, um, then more interest gets starts turning to Woolman. Yeah, and I think there's been, we were talking prior to the episode of like, I think the last 20 years has really been, um, I want to call it a renaissance, but it's almost like the first birth really of like really serious kind of Woolman scholarship that's really broadened out our understanding of his context and his ideas and his life beyond just kind of that, the popular image. Mm -hmm. Um, And that takes us, I think, up to the special issue that you edited. Could you tell me a little bit as you were editing, there are about five essays. We'll link this in the kind of show notes for you to check out if you want to. It's an open access journal. Yeah. So um, that's a really great thing. Anyone can kind of access these essays. And I think they're all fairly accessible Mm -hmm. to just as a read. Um, So it's a great place to start if you're wanting to learn more or catch up on what you know about John Woolman. John, what stood out to you? Well, I guess, what did you start out expecting maybe when you put out the call for putting together this special issue? And then what did you end up with? What stood out to you um, in terms of the, the pieces that were eventually published? Well, I I should say full disclosure. I published a piece (laughs) in this special issue. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So Jay, Jay contributed a, a wonderful piece to the, um, to the issue. Uh, I, you know, I think I probably was expecting a little, maybe perhaps I would have been expecting more like reinterpret reinterpretation of the history of, mm. uh, of the, of the history, um, the historical interpretation of woman. I mean, like, you know, now we have we have more lenses for understanding and for looking at Woolman and the times in which he lived. And I, I think I, at first I was expecting more of that, um, and we we do have some of that in there. But I'm actually I'm just very pleased at the way it turned out with the different approaches. Um, you know, so we have a, we have a historical piece that that revisits some of you know some common kind of misconceptions about the way you know Woolman approached. Um, empire and um, and economy. We have um, essays that fall into the this category of how he was received historically, and the the material in these two buckets or in this bucket of of how he was received is is was new to me. 
Um, and some of it, you, because the, the authors of the, the piece that analyzed Douglas Steer and Elton Trueblood actually had access to their, to, to the, the version, to their editions of Woolman's writing so they could see the marginalia, mm. you know, that's like a new, uh, just a, a, a new depth of interpretation that they were able to bring. And then, and then the, the third bucket would be um, this, this stranger me meekness um, theme, um, looking at, at how Woolman you know, kind of self-conceptualized and how he described his spirituality. Um, and that's, you know, Jay's um, you know, portion was in there. And so I'm, I was really thrilled with, with these approaches and unearthing new material, you know, 250 years after mm -hmm. his death, mm -hmm. we are unearthing, you know, new material about how he has um, been, been received um, over time and, and still expanding our, our understanding and our, and our knowledge of him. So, so that was just really, um, really nice to see. Uh, that we can make an original contribution in that way. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was really exciting to read. And, um, you know, as a woman scholar, exciting to see new work coming out. Um, and we'll look ahead a little bit to, I think, where women can go. But I think we could pause a little bit on, like, where we've, where woman is now. I wonder if we might, if we think about kind of a lot of the reception of woman, um, for Quakers, but also for non-Quakers as kind of what we might think of as hagiographic. Hey, so holding up uh, Woolman as a saintly figure um, who's just really to be admired, who did great things. Uh, there's kind of maybe like a golden tinge to the way we think about him. Um, I want to take a stab at kind of summarizing who Woolman is now for us based on this research, and then maybe you could add to it for um, so we can flesh that out. So I think now one thing we think about is we sometimes like woman seen as like an American figure um, and he is in colonial America, but very much now we recognize that woman was like situated in the context of the British empire. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things about uh, our recognition of woman today is thinking about like an imperial context, a colonial context. Um, so both, you know, woman doesn't conceive of himself as an American, even though he is born in America and, you know, he's thinking about his relationship to Britain. Um, and, um, so that also means comes with it, like Britain's like commercial empire, um, that's built on slavery, the kind of development of capitalism this time, the displacement of indigenous peoples. So we definitely think about woman's imperial context more. Um, I think as we were talking about earlier, I think we talk about him much more in the context of, a reform movement in Quakerism and not isolated. That doesn't necessarily come out as much in these essays, actually. I think they're all pretty focused on Woolman, understandably, but we definitely don't see him as an isolated prophetic voice, but very much someone who's a part of a community. Um, I think we're also maybe more aware, um, Gene Soderlund's essay touches on this, of some of May Woolman's shortcomings. So he is... Um, you know, an advocate and he's concerned about <clears throat> Native Americans, particularly the Lenny Lenape. Um, and he has some connections, but he doesn't necessarily follow through completely on that. And we also know that he doesn't think this way at the beginning of his life. Um, there's a lot of change over time in his awareness of what Native peoples are experiencing because of um, British colonialism. Um, I'd say that's another big piece is like we recognize that woman did develop over time. Um, he wasn't just a static, there's kind of a thought, there's a famous anecdote at the beginning of his life of how he refuses to write a will, right? Um, or not a will, but he refuses to write a bill of sale for an enslaved person. Um, and we can kind of read that anecdote and think like he believed all of his radical ideas at the beginning of his life and he just carried them all the way through. But one of the things I think that we recognize about Woolman that I think is quite humanizing now is that we see his thought develops over time. Um, from a thought that's maybe a little more tentative and a little more cautious to something that's really quite radical and bold. Um, I have more thoughts, but I'm wondering, do you think that's a good sketch of like who we think of as woman today based on other scholars and then this um, special issue? Yeah, I do think so. Um, and um, and I think you going on the, the last piece that you mentioned about his development over time, um, you know, I, th I think that he, you know, he is He's learning 
to, you know, over the course of his life and in his journal, you can see this, he's kind of learning to, you know, as he would describe it, like really focus on the, on his understanding of the revelation of God, um, as opposed to mm. the, even the Quaker tradition. And so he struggles with, is it okay as a young man, he struggles, is it okay for me to like contradict this elder in my, in my meeting mm -hmm. who thinks differently than I do? Like, is that something that's okay to do? Uh, and, and, but by the end, he is, he is able you know, to just to really come into himself and understand his interpretations, his his sense of God's leading, um, to to be to be you know ac you know accurate and and something that he needs to share with the community on the behalf of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you know, I I I think you know, Woolman has has always been kind of upheld at, for for dealing well with conflict. Um, and I think, and that's that's mm. largely true. I mean, he he works with people he disagrees with in a way that he tries not to alienate them, and and so he has great you know interpersonal debates with these people who he disagrees with. Uh, but and I I think also you know to add to that though, is you know as he's as he's doing that, he is also you know, suffering with this and and going through like intense personal angst with this, um, uh, you know, with this prospect of being estranged in some ways from his own community and mm -hmm. having to contradict his own community. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, he really identifies with the prophet Jeremiah. And so I, I think now we have this, this sense of him as um, not always being accepted and and not always being you know he was called singular mm -hmm. um, and to be you know to be singular in his community meant kind of out of step in some ways mm -hmm. and so we have a, i think a much more a much better understanding of of how woolman's path was was not always e it was, certainly wasn't easy for him it certainly led to some contention within his quaker community um and 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 he had some some you know, intense personal suffering um, mm -hmm. as he um, as he you know went through this. And I think you know your article on strangers and woman identifying himself as a stranger. You can kind of sense that you know that he's really identifying with the prophet Jeremiah. And mm -hmm. if he could and be faithful, he would choose a different path, one that kind of went more with the flow. Mm -hmm. But especially by the end of his life, um, say you know by the time you know the last 15 years, we could say he's, he is really feeling his role as calling the community back to or towards like the truest, what he understands is the truest sense of itself, mm -hmm. the most faithful embodiment of, of his tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, and some of that comes, comes up more in his later essays, which mm -hmm. have not always been easily accessible. Right. Uh, and now they're slightly more um, accessible than they were, but his his essays have have not been published with the same frequency as his journal. And in his journal, we or in his essays, we see some of his most radical material. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, his essay that's alternatively titled "A Plea for the Poor" mm -hmm. or um, "A Word of Caution to the Rich" mm -hmm. um, is, in some ways, his most substantive, comprehensive essay that I think shows that at the end of his life, he's integrating his critique of slavery with a critique of labor and I'd even say like economy, capitalism in the British Empire mm -hmm. and the pressure that puts on all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. He integrates that into Native American concerns. Um, it's not published till 20 years after his, yeah. after his death. Um, and we don't, we still don't know a lot about that essay mm -hmm. and, and like why it took so long to be published. Soderlund sort of suggests that it's because it was maybe his friends thought it might have been too radical. Um, I like your point about that, even though he is someone who works with people who disagree with, you know, that can be really resonant today in a time of like yeah. polarization. It's like we all want to figure out how we can relate to people we can disagree with better. And we tend to think, I think of that position as like, oh, you're a reconciler. You like bring people together. You're like a unity figure. But really very paradoxically, he, by like being able to connect with people um, or talk with people in a constructive way, because um, our sense, at least from his journal, is that people did receive 
I think he was a quite humble, like mm-hmm. maybe extremely humble. That's where the meekness comes in. And people did receive him. They weren't necessarily alienated mm-hmm. by him in conversation, it seems. Yeah. Um, but he was alienated. It's not like he became this great reconciling, like unitive kind of political figure. You know, he ends up kind of self-marginalizing because he feels like that's his vocation. Yeah. And that's a wild paradox. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and especially for someone who I think you know, really, I mean, he he really wants his Quaker community to be faithful, and he really values his community, but he finds himself, you know, standing, you know, taking positions that his his good friends um, view as extreme, mm-hmm. and you know, so, so much to the point that some of his friends, when he goes to England, write a letter. To right. in advance of his arrival, that you know, John Woolman, he is a he's a good guy. He's a little extreme. Just kind of let him be. Uh-huh. But um, like, so his friends like took care to kind of yeah improve the reception that he would receive, mm-hmm. um, so that he could you know continue to be faithful, um, but also um, people would understand who he was. And of course, by that time, he was wearing undyed clothing, mm-hmm. um, which so he looked visibly. He looked visibly different from his Quaker community, mm-hmm. um, which was wearing the more wearing the traditional. Yeah, you know, gray. And that's maybe another sense of like the portrait of Woolman now is also a little more of just like his weirdness. Mm-hmm. Like, there's kind of a weirdness to John Woolman that I think we're a little more aware of. Yeah, um, or or eccentricity. He's a great contrast in some ways to probably if there's anyone who's more significant than Woolman in the 18th century, it's probably Anthony Benezet, mm-hmm. who's a major um, abolitionist writer writes for a much broader audience, is like mm-hmm. instrumental in the abolition of the British slave trade, um, who's also quite intense, mm-hmm. very much a reformer, very intense spirituality, very ascetic in some ways, but is also much more cosmopolitan, mm-hmm. I think, in his attitude um, in a way that doesn't make him – he's also a teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's much more embedded. He doesn't seem as alienated from community as woman is, which is um, maybe an interesting byway that could be explored in another space and time. Um, John, what do you think are the questions about woman or for woman studies looking forward from an issue like this? What are, what are questions that this issue raises? What are questions you have um, that scholars might continue to think about? Yeah. I I mean, I, I would really like to, I think it's worth considering how, you know, this, this group of essays at the end of his life, um, there were mm-hmm. there were a handful of essays. Some were longer, some were shorter. Um, that how those essays, you know, what they say, continue what they say about him, and how they help us understand um, the the progression of his life, um, and even you know what was his you know what was his goal? Like what was he wanting to do at that at that point in time? Um, so I I think th- those those essays, um, the the journal is very famous, but those I think those essays could provide some more um, room for thought. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I think that that could be another avenue to go. Um, and I, I think also that you know, the, the lens of, of understanding, which you know, I've kind of started to do this, of understanding Woolman as like a popular theologian. Mm-hmm. So he, he wasn't an academic theologian in, you know, in any sense of the word, um, but, but on a popular level. As you know, from the as a grassroots theologian, I think that you know there's there's more that we can we can you know push that envelope a little bit further, um, and think about what are the you know how are these even how are these philosophical literary how are these trends coming to him how is um, how is he interpreting the the movements the historical movements um, and the philosophical movements as they are as they are developing in the colonies, which is just really a rich a rich mm-hmm. place and time to be. And woman, you know, woman is very aware of what's going on. Uh, I think, you know, I think he's, he's reading the paper. He's, he's mm-hmm. not in, he doesn't live in Philadelphia, but he goes to Philadelphia a lot. And Philadelphia is just a major hub, yeah. you know, within the British empire. And mm-hmm. there's, uh, you know, there's lots of ideas, lots of cultures that are, that are making its way through, you know, and so woman does not, he he never specifically you know, refers to the 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 angst developing in the colonies about you know England 
um, in the you know in the seventeen seventy in the early seventeen seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know other other Quakers and and other you know, other um, colonial writers you know by the seventeen sixties are writing tracts that are protesting the way Britain is treating the colonies. And so Woolman doesn't mention these, and um, he doesn't talk about that in in any of the writings that that I have seen. But I think what that that implies, though, is that is that there is there's an unwritten history, that's an unwritten context that as yet has not been fully applied to them, just because he has not he does not specifically reference it, but certainly he is aware. Mm-hmm. He certainly knows about that. There's there's tension between the colonies and England at this time, mm-hmm. um, and that's you know just one example where. You know, what are the other kind of unwritten um, histories and contexts that are impacting Woolman uh, that he's not explicit about, but that are you know behind the scenes? Mm-hmm. And so you know, and I'd love to see you know I'm I'm really fascinated by what I consider his apocalypticism, and I'd love to see you know more about you know where does he develop that and how. You know, is he is he is this coming from his from the early Quaker tradition, or is this coming from other sources, or mm-hmm. is this you know simply his own reading of the Bible? How how is this developing? I'd you know I'd love to see just more about the 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 influence on him that aren't explicit already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that all is really resonant, and there's so many fascinating connections between like what Quakers are doing internally politically and then the way politics in the colonies goes because you have like Quakers are very locked into – well, I think actually Benazet says this eventually. He's like all these Americans are like focused on like how they're slaves to Britain. Shouldn't they be talking about like how – like the people they're enslaving? So Benazet actually makes that connection. You know, consumer politics is a big part of the American Revolution and the protesting about like – taxes on commodities and Woolman's kind of doing like consumer politics and his renunciation of sugar or like rum or these mm-hmm. kind of things. So there's a lot there. Um, for me as a literary scholar, and I do this a little bit in the article I wrote, you know, I think there's still a lot to do in terms of Woolman's aesthetics and prose style. I and mean, this is what you're saying of like, I think our sense of his writings is still pretty dominated by the journal mm-hmm. and the essays. And we, we have a sense that he's a beautiful prose writer, um, and that that's a really significant part about why he's remembered so well. But I don't know if we have a great account of his prose style yet. And I also wonder in relationship to these later writings too, if even though the Moulton edition, which is published in the 70s, is great, and we've had other editions come out, I do wonder if we could also, if with all the research we have now and other things, if we might be due for like another edition of John Woolman's writing soon. Right. Oh, that yeah, that would be fascinating. <laughs> yeah, when that... You know, brings brings all of it like a, a, a comprehensive um, edition. Yeah, that would that would be great. And I, and our understanding of of what Woolman was thinking is is changing. And it, you know, even um, you know during during my time when you know when I was studying Woolman um, for my PhD dissertation, you know, I had been searching for this mysterious you know York mm. manuscript. Yes, and, oh. and it had been yeah. you know and. And I'd been writing letters to libraries and trying to find it, and it had been just kind of misfiled. A copy of the manuscript had been misfiled, and it, somebody knew where it was and was able to um, give me a copy of it. Uh, and you know, it's different than than what like mm-hmm. Amelia Montgomery and her yes. what her most comprehensive um, edition of Woolman's Journal and Essays. Uh, and you know, there's there's one point where. In in our understanding, in our in our text that many people had had for you know a hundred years, um, it said that John Woolman was thankful that he was able to make this journey with no noise, um, and you know it's like oh, and that really supports this view of this quietistic view of Woolman yeah, of like yeah. self-effacing and um, uh, and spiritually you know inward dwelling, but r- the the text the actual manuscript says, and I was I was thankful that I could make this journey with no horse. Um, mm. and which is very, you know, yeah. a very different. I very mean, different. <laughs> it it shapes, um, it shapes our understanding of what Woolman was thinking and what his aims and goals were, and so even you know even the discovery of the York manuscript, and I think we're still even trying to settle on the text, you know, mm-hmm. in some sense, and yeah, uh, and there's work that can be done in making the text, you know, more readily available, um, including the 
the internal arguments that woman and the internal arguments that woman has with himself among his manuscripts on how he's going to present sure. his message. Yeah. Um, that, that Moulton does a good job for the journal, but that, you know, there's, there's room for more of that, um, that that would be a real asset to, to the scholars of Woolman um, and, and just a great picture of what, you know, colonial American life was like, at least for this particular Quaker uh, mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, uh, this is very deep cuts Quaker studies, but your <laughs> article on the York manuscript is amazing. So people should check it out. Um, I want to end John with a kind of question could go back to this idea of like, all right, even though we've kind of gotten a more complicated, complex view of Woolman now, he's still someone we look to as prescient and radical and who, um, who saw his world maybe more clearly than others around him did, or at least articulated that better um, and connected that not just in a, not just in terms of social analysis, but was deeply grounded in his own spiritual life. So I'm curious if we could just conclude by talking about, you know, what's the kind of practical application or what's the takeaway for, you know, for beyond thinking about woman just as an academic or thinking about him just as like an academic topic, but thinking about for a woman how he impacts our own lives, whether we're Quaker or non-Quaker. Um, you know, what's how does the new portrait of woman that's emerged uh, help us today in thinking about how we live our own lives? Yeah, and I think we've we've alluded to this a couple times in this conversation already, but I think his synthesis of the the inward and outward. Uh, is is something that 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 through history you, that readers of Woolman have latched onto and that still have you know, have incredible application. Mm -hmm. uh, so so he he just does not see the distinction between you know, the social application of one's faith and the you know, as well as the spiritual like in, this this the inward spiritual conversion you know to his faith. Uh, for for him, he he held those those together so well, and in in a in a complex time, uh, that I think it continues to be a model for mm -hmm. for people today who who are really trying to live this like this authentic, um, integrated Christian life, uh, and and so I I find that is a you know really important lesson that um, that. This new picture of woman, this more um, you know, more nuanced um, picture of woman, is is really mm -hmm. advocating. Mm -hmm. uh, I have I have a lot of others as you know as well. But do, do you? Have yeah, anything? I mean, I think I think what's helpful to me about the nuanced portrait. I actually think of a quote from the 20th century Catholic writer and activist Dorothy Day, mm. um, who's being considered for sainthood in the Catholic Church right now. But she famously said, "Don't call me a saint." I don't want to be written off that easily. And I think that very much with Woolman, because I think when we get into the nitty gritty of his life and that portrait and his world, um, it hits a little closer to home and we don't, you know, is his, our view of him isn't quite as like gauzy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it can be more challenging, yeah. even more so challenging to see like the depth of the commitment he made. Um, the intensity of his culture to wrestle with like how intense should we be is, was he too intense? I think that's worth wrestling with. Um, but I think ultimately what's helpful in moving beyond the hagiographic hey, saintly view of woman is to recognize that he was a complex human being mm -hmm. and that like the woman we remember today was someone who developed over time and who really struggled to become who he was and who suffered. Um, and I think, uh, I think that is humanizing to him, and I think it can be empowering for all of us as we're on our own individual like journeys that are not perfect, they're not gauzy. You know, we have our own kind of struggles to become the integrated um, people that we want to be. And so, I think for me, as I from going with my initial, I'm, I'm sure it was maybe similar to you of like you encounter a woman initially and you're blown away. Um, and then as you sit with him, you get into all this complexity and he becomes more human to you. And um, that's not a loss. It's not like it's not like we're demystifying Woolman. Um, it's a sense of like we're actually understanding his own struggle um, to be a faithful Christian, a faithful Quaker. Um, and that's just really useful. 
Yeah, I think I, I think so. yeah. For me, it was. I mean, certainly the same the same kind of outline of the story. You know, learned about Woolman for the first time here at George Fox University, mm-hmm. and it was you know the the big kind of overarching. Um, you know, he did these amazing things, and um, he led the Quaker community to an anti slavery stance, and it, you know, it was like the um, I don't know the it's like the Athanasius contra mundum kind of a sense, mm. this Athanasius against the world mm. um, kind of sense of standing up. Um, but when we, but my, you're looking at Woolman and really, and studying his, his journal and, and, and the, the work that has been done by so many people over the last you know 20 years, um, I think it, it does take off that gauze. And, and, and what we, we see someone who is, really, really, he's struggling to understand. And he's being so transparent about his, yes. you know, within his journal, he is so transparent mm-hmm. about his, his, what he's trying to do and, um, and the implications of his actions. You know, if I, I want to help, you know, I want to, to do this good work, but in the process, I'm, I'm perhaps, you participating in an unjust system that's oppressing others, uh, and he really lays that out pub, the the struggle of that um, mm-hmm. for his for his readers, um, and I think it it kind of it it normalizes you know struggle and um, and uncertainty in in ways that I think are you know that help us not you know turn woman into a a. a, a like a, a ceramic kind of figure that you can put on a shelf and say, yes, that was mm-hmm. woman. He did great things. Um, but actually challenges us to think about, um, you know, that what struggles are we having or should we be having, you know, how should we, how should we be really, you know, thinking about the implications of our faith and our action, um, in just in, in our day to day lives to, to, to really understand what's going on. Uh, Cause I mean, woman was, he was incredibly bright um, mm. and incredibly bright and mm. able to see like large. Pretty well schooled for a planter, I think yeah. is what he calls himself. Yeah, in his exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, you would not, you know, he, he was self-read and, you know, very much, um, he, he understood like, you know, economies and, yes. and, and forces that were going on invisibly, but that were impacting the world Um in, in important ways. Uh, and so he was able to see all that. He is, I think we, we really need to understand and appreciate his complexity. And, and I think that that, that when we do that, that's actually helpful because it, it prevents us from, from, you know, like Dorothy Day said, from writing him off. Mm -hmm. Well, John, thank you for your work in helping us understand Woolman in a more complex way. I should mention John's the author of a wonderful book called John Woolman and the Government of Christ um, that gets into John Woolman's theology. He also recently edited this special issue of Quaker Studies um, that I encourage you to check out. John, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. This video podcast is a production of George Fox Digital. To find more material like this, you can subscribe to George Fox Talks on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews, and we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.